Uh, Alexander Fisher. Yes. Father's Howard Fisher. Uh, he's an attorney. Uh, so okay. Um, let's so. get going. Uh, I guess I officially call this meeting to order. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. Thanks, everybody who uh, you get who's here. Yes. Welcome. All right. I have uh, uh, Brad, Jessica, John, Dean, Paige, Josh, Kevin, Peter, and Matt. And uh, I know more coming. Okay. Uh, I don't really have anything to report from uh, the board chair, so I'll turn it over to you for reporters. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Good to see you here today. Welcome to the last board meeting of the year. We've uh, made it. Everybody's bright and early. I like it. Um, as always, thanks to Pete's Coffee and Skylight Gardens for their generosity and hospitality. We appreciate it. Uh, let me begin by introducing your board packet. On the left-hand side, you'll see the agenda for today's meeting. This is followed by a copy of my report, and then the consent calendar items, so the minutes from the last board meeting, the financials from September and October 2019, uh, the most up-to-date board attendance sheet, and then uh, the minutes from the committees that have met since the last board meeting. This would be Queen Safe, Business Attraction Retention, and then the Executive Committee. On the right-hand side of your packets, you'll see some items relevant to today's meeting. Uh, the first page is a copy of a letter that um, I've sent to Councilmember Kretz and then also all the members of the Metro Board. And this is regarding the Sepulveda Transit Corridor and uh, the Board's desire um, that uh, this uh, project be underground, have a stop on the campus, and also directly connect to the Purple Line stations on Wilshire in Westwood. Um, this has been sent to all the Metro Board members and I'll have a little bit more information on that in a second. Uh, and this is followed by the most up-to-date board contact sheet and then the uh, quarterly reports for marketing and uh, operations. Stephen, how are you? Good morning. A um, few items I'll highlight in my report. Uh, the Parking Benefit District, this is the local revenue return program that will return to us a portion of parking meter revenues. It's slowly making its way through the process. An MOU that the uh, city is drafting that we would have to sign is going to the T Committee for approval. Um, the bad news is this won't happen until early next year. So um, we're tracking it, we're nagging for this to go through, but uh, it's going to take a little bit of time. Uh, speaking of projects that have taken a little time, the next one on the item, the $5 after 5 p.m. parking uh, promotion program, this program that actually outdates some of you on the board, we've been working on it for so long. Um, it's a program intended to offer those who have parking resources who are willing to offer them at a $5 flat rate after 5 p.m. and on uh, weekends, uh, will in turn then uh, um, be allowed to promote those parking uh, locations in the public right away. So this has been with LADOT for some time now. Uh, they have actually finally finished and approved their own draft MOU and uh, sent it to me, I had one small tweak, and uh, we're hopeful we can have this launched in early 2020. So UCLA has been a great partner in this program, and uh, we hope maybe we can add uh, more folks to this program in the future. Uh, as the council member uh, told us at our annual meeting a couple weeks ago, the taxi zone behind us, it's, uh, I don't see any cabs there now, but um, in theory it's still there, but the work order has been executed. So this is going to be moved. So uh, the taxi zone will not be in that location for much longer. Patrick, good morning. Hey, good morning. Uh, the Metro Business Interruption Fund, as everybody recalls, back at our July meeting, Metro came and informed us that the parameters of the Metro Business Interruption Fund would not include the entire village, only the areas where construction immediately impacts businesses. So businesses that are immediately impacted by construction could then apply to be uh, uh, have some type of cost recovery or um, loss recovery to uh, um, their revenues that you know, they've lost as a result of the uh, construction. I thought it was just along Wall Street. Yes, so oh, right in the immediate area. So that's, yeah. and that's the current plan. But so I think the thinking is completely wrong on this, because it's going to impact the village. So no, that, yeah, that's why we, well, that's yeah. why we, yeah. that, that's why we, that's why we got a little bit upset. We, we've been, we've been pushing. So I've met with senior Metro staff since then, and uh, unfortunately they have the same feeling as the uh, lower level Metro staff that came and met with us. So I've asked that this be, uh, agendized for the Metro Board so they can have a discussion about it. So we have one other we need, 
Yeah, I mean, if that's going to happen, I think it's important that there be a representative from us, not just them, there. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, obviously, the argument that we need to make is that we are in a unique geographic situation compared to other stops along the route. Because mm -hmm. obviously, if they give it to us, they're going to say, well, then we have to go back and give it to all these other areas, and we have to prove that we are in you know, a unique situation with less uh, flow of traffic. I know this is not the time for it, but that's right. critical. Right. Yeah. yeah, I agree. I don't, I don't know if anyone's seen that if you drive a little from Boulevard, East, and you notice that Beverly, Bull Beverly Drive and Canada Drive are closed to northbound traffic. If, if that's the game plan here, that's going to be severely deleterious. And we, is there some way we could, like, insist that Peter and um, Cannon closed because Spotville wanted it closed? They wanted it closed. Yeah, we own 9401 Wilshire, and Spotville and some of the other restaurants felt that um, when they watched what happened further east, they lost, the restaurants lost a lot of business because people didn't know how to get to the restaurants. And they felt that it would be better to close it and train people how to get to those restaurants than to have people go through a big maze. And so so it's, it's a temporary closure, but it's for two years. Um, but, the, but that was at Spago's insistence. That wasn't that much. Is it something that we should consider as like preemptive? that maybe we start educating people that when these streets are going to be closed or disrupted, mm -hmm. that we, uh, we, we make culture arrangements so that people know that the village is still open for business. I think that's a, a good idea, but I think we've got to agendize that before we can really talk about it. Yeah. Well, I think our, our agenda today, we have an item to talk about outreach and promotions. Yeah, um, so we can talk so about we'll it now. Yeah. yeah. But uh, so, um, so the short of it is, is uh, Metro staff has their marching orders from the board, from their board. They need their board to change their tune, uh, for their marching orders to change. So that's what we're advocating for. We've been working with Sheila Kuehl's office to get that meeting since Supervisor Kuehl is on the Metro board. And uh, to, to Dean's point, are we going to be notified of when that meeting will be so we can have a representative? Yeah, and we need it to, to happen. I mean, it's right. not, um, yeah, not scheduled yet, but I, I hope it will be. Um, Westwood Access Day, uh, this is an item that um, we chatted about the last Clean, Safe, and Beautiful meeting, but it's going to be this coming Wednesday. Um, this is a day where we bring social service providers to one location and then invite our local homeless population to this location um, so they can uh, hopefully connect with services that will, will change their lives. So we are very fortunate. We have 21 service providers now confirmed um, to attend, and we have a lot of volunteers. We have some great community partners. The Broxton Brew Pub is going to be providing food. Thanks, Paige. Uh, TJ's is uh, as also sponsoring flame boilers, going to do food, Pete's, Noah's, Ross has donated, uh, CD5 has donated, Sheila Kill's office is um, paying for the showers that we're going to have on site. Um, it's going to be a really great event, so I'm very excited for that this coming Wednesday. So stay tuned for feedback on that item. A couple more things to talk about regarding events. We have a fun one coming up this Saturday, December 7th. Uh, we're doing a Cinema Under the Stars event on Broxton, sort of a holiday theme. This is our second year of doing so. Uh, we're doing a double feature, Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer, followed by National Lampoon's Christmas Vacation, which we just learned is celebrating its 30th anniversary, so very, very timely. But we'll also have uh, music, um, uh, an improv group might come and perform. We're hoping hot cocoa, pictures of Santa, photo booth, kids crafts, all that kind of stuff. So it starts at 4 o'clock. Movie starts at 5.30. And then lastly, thanks to all who came and attended our annual meeting uh, a couple weeks ago. I appreciate it. Uh, I thought it was a really good meeting, and I really appreciated the comments from the Director of Planning, Vince Bertoni. I thought he really tied in uh, Westwood into Los Angeles and talking about planning and, and uh, the future of the city, while also um, talking a little bit about how that relates to Westwood. So I, I really appreciated him coming, and I, I thanked him uh, many times over. So that's what I have. Okay. Uh, committee reports. So, uh, is there a public input? Oh, I'm sorry. You're right. There's no public input on staff report. No, no. Next item. Oh, yeah. Next item. Actually, let me, before we go off that really, really quickly, Kevin, I'm, I'm so sorry. Um, uh, Andrew, you skipped over one thing that I was just curious about. So the city has leased two vacant storefronts on the Crocs and parking yeah. structure. Do we know what those businesses are? One of them is a business called Splatter, which is a uh, sort of do-it-yourself um, ceramic pottery place, kind of like Color Me Mine. So they're going through the design and build out phase, and that's for the big space. Right. The smaller space, I believe, has been leased out to one of the existing paths. And I'm not sure if they're going to be using that as a, in addition to their current location or maybe moving in, into a smaller location. Okay. Yeah. Thank you.
you. I'm, I'm, yeah, that's and why I was going to be. One question. Before. Where is the, uh, I, I missed that, the access day being held? The, uh, it's going to be at the Westwood mm -hmm. Presbyterian Church. Westwood Presbyterian Church, yeah. Okay, so uh, public comment, Steve. Thank you. Um, just one comment on the access day is fantastic. Just one thought for next year. I think the timing was a little bit better last time. This is literally the day before Thanksgiving, and I know folks are already, some of them are already leaving to go out of town that Wednesday to avoid the crazy Thursday traffic um, at the airport. So you might want to consider pulling it back a little bit because I do know some folks that would like to, would have liked to participate, but they're going to be out of town. So just a comment, but it's a fantastic event. Um, a few comments on the annual meeting, and I shared these with Andrew, so I just want to share them with the board. I've been to all, I think, eight of them, and some have been great, some not so great. I thought this one was a good one. I think Vince is a very smart guy. Um, I do think, and I've mentioned this, that the format, maybe for next year to maybe think about that, to ask somebody to come and speak and give a speech, which is basically what Vince did, I found it very interesting because I find planning and zoning, that's something I am interested in. But I did notice people sitting around me, kind of eyes were glazing over as he was getting into jargon and TOC this and tier three that. And I think the format that you used the year before with Annie Philbin was a much more effective format where you moderated. For example, had you had something like a Dana Cuff, who is a very distinguished professor at UCLA, we all know Dana, had she been there in a kind of a comfy setting in two easy chairs, not sitting at a, not at a podium, and she could have been asking questions that directed the conversation more to Westwood, saying, well, there's TOC, transit-oriented communities. What do you think, Vince, that's going to mean for Westwood Village? Or there's blah, 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 zoning code. How do you see that impacting us right here? And I just think it allows you to control the conversation a little more, as opposed to saying to a speaker, they're going to talk about what they find interesting, but not necessarily what our audience finds relevant. So that's just a format suggestion for next year. The only other comment is, I think, not printing the annual report in a hard copy. Maybe I'm super old school. I know that young people live only on their phones, but some of the older people in the world do like to have something in writing. If you think about it, a real estate broker, when they meet a tenant, they still hand a piece of paper, a setup. Maybe that's very old fashioned, but they don't just say, oh, go to our website and look at the setup of the building. And I know you're trying to save costs and be green, but I do think there's a value in maybe not printing it on heavy paper, but having some print copies that you have. It's a marketing tool. It's a sales tool. When people are thinking about investing in the area, to be able to hand them something and hopefully they go home and they see the pretty pictures, they leaf through it, and it sells the message. So I do think having zero versions in writing is a problem because it, then it's just literally in the vapor. Maybe people download it, maybe they don't. The last comment I want to make is, and I have talked to Andrew about this as well, it's been a kind of a pattern I've seen for a while, and that is I know when the press calls the bid office, as they do constantly, the Daily Bruin especially, and they call Andrew on topics that the board has taken no position on. And I see Andrew expressing his opinion, and that's he's entitled to his opinion, but for example, there was a recent story about the nomination of the Tonino Ristorante building by Paul Rivera Williams, the most renowned African-American architect of the 20th century. This building absolutely deserves to be on the National Register and has been identified that way for 40 years. And then the comments are such it suggests that the board has taken Thank the position you. and the board hasn't. So I just want to say that I think that Will if it's something no one's talked about, the thing to say is no comment. Uh, Let's uh, move to the reports. Um, Bill couldn't make it today. Uh, he had uh, something come up uh, at home that he needed to take care of. Is anybody from Clean Safe here? Yeah. Sure thing. Uh, this uh, dates back to our September 25th meeting of the Clean, Safe, and Beautiful Committee. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, I'll try to get through this quickly. We've got a lot to cover today. Uh, so uh, as we've already touched on a little bit this morning, uh, there was a discussion about uh, the Western Village Access Day. Um, we talked a little bit about how uh, incredibly successful it was last year, how many people it touched, how many people it helped. Um, and how excited we were that it was going to be happening again. Obviously, it hasn't happened, so I don't have any new numbers for this year, but again, it is next Wednesday at Western Presbyterian Church, and uh, we in our community are very, very excited um, to be helping as many people as uh, we will, will hopefully be doing. Uh, the other issue that we discussed was uh, the possibility of bringing free Wi-Fi to Westwood Village. Um, uh, the most exciting part about that is that if it were to happen, it's free. Not just to the people who use it, but to Westwood Village as well. We don't pay for this. Um, the uh, financing gets covered by the telecom companies, um, but there are lots of permissions and things that need to happen. So uh, the company who brings this to neighborhoods, um, a 
company called Sky Packets. Um, they are working on that because we did say that we were very interested, obviously, in providing this service to our community. And so they are speaking with telecom companies and, uh, and at some point if that moves forward also with the associated businesses who need to give permission for them to put towers on their buildings. So there's a lot of moving parts that go along. Um, but uh, if it happens, um, that would be fantastic. And then we can let them you know if there are certain corridors that it would start on um, as a trial to see how it goes. And then hopefully, if that's successful, then it could expand to the entire Westwood Village area. And that's it. John, Blair, we have the Haynes uh, and Company here today, and so the bar committee meeting is going to be incorporated into today's meeting. So you're going to get everybody's going to get to see what we saw, which was which was great, and uh, I think you'll enjoy it. Okay. And then lastly, the executive committee met last week, and uh, the highlights of that meeting were uh, actually based on some public comment. We set a credit card policy. And so uh, we have a new policy related to the credit card where uh, the expenses are going on to that and one of the check signers will review what's on the credit card and make sure that uh, everything is uh, as it should be before we sign those checks. And then we went into closed session and we discussed uh, Andrew's compensation, which uh, uh, we made a recommendation for a uh, 4% raise and a 10% bonus. So we've got to put that in front of... Uh, Actually, those were determined. The recommendation is, uh, is on the agenda today. Oh, sorry. Yeah. sorry. My bad. I had a different highlight of that meeting. Which we determined that there would be a 4% raise and a 10% yeah. bonus. Um, and uh, I guess that's it. All right, so we'll move to the consent calendar. So does anybody have any questions on the things that we need to approve today? Uh, I would move that we approve this consent calendar. Uh, second. Second. Okay. In favor? Aye. 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 Here we go. Okay, now to the fun part. Um, we are electing members uh, for the executive committee today. Oh, sorry, uh, ad hoc nominating committee oh. recommendation. My bad. Uh, thank you for keeping it. <laughs> no problem. Dean didn't, didn't mean to steal your thunder. No problem. <clears throat> so, um, obviously we still have one board seat uh, remaining to fill. Um, it is a vacant zone one seat. So the ad hoc uh, nominating committee uh, met recently. Uh, the committee consists of uh, Brad Erickson, Kevin Crummy, Jessica Dabney, and me. Uh, Brad, of course, was not able to attend the last meeting, but we still had a quorum, so we were able to continue with the meeting. Uh, so we did. Uh, we had a wonderful meeting with Jeremy Wolf, who is with us today. Um, he is a representative of Topa and also the Cole family. Sorry. They, um, what's that? Just Cole. Just Sorry, just Cole. Just Excuse Cole. me. Sorry. Um, Cole family, they own the Whole Foods building, the adjacent parking structure, Barney's Beanery, the adjacent parking lot, um, Ami Sushi, and the Landmark Theater that is currently being remodeled. Um, I'll tell you about a little bit more in a second, but uh, does anybody else on the nominating committee um, want to say anything about theater? Yes, you're here. I, I, I'd like to say something. I mean, Jeremy, excuse me. Uh, this was not Jeremy's first time interviewing for the position. I believe it was your third. Mm -hmm. Um, which really shows some dedication and interest to being a part of this organization. Jeremy has attended many of our meetings before. He has uh, experience working uh, in nonprofit boards in other organizations, and um, he's familiar with this area and very dedicated to this area. And I, I he was an, an outstanding candidate the first and the second time that he interviewed, and, and remains an outstanding candidate. I think he had, will bring a lot of value to our board, and I'm, I'm, I'm hopeful that I will have the opportunity to work with him. Thank you. And uh, actually, at this time, Jeremy, would you like to say a few words um, about yourself? Just a lifetime resident of the West Side, grew up coming to Westwood Village, uh, would love to see the village revitalized, so, and help in any way I can with that. Anybody else on the board have any comments or thoughts or questions? Jeremy, where's the Cole family office? Is it down south somewhere? Uh, they have an office in Brentwood and an office in the Valley. Oh, 
Um, and I can uh, very happily say that uh, as an, uh, the nominating committee um, did vote unanimously in favor of uh, inviting um, Mr. Wolf to join us. And so, uh, unless there are any other final comments or questions, I would uh, I would actually like to make the motion to please approve uh, the um, filling of the z vacant zone one seat by Mr. Jeremy Wolf. Would you have public comment first if we have any? Oh, apologies. Public comment? I move again. I second again. All in favor? All right. All right. Mr. Wolf, won't you please come join us? <laughs> okay, now to the election. So we need to uh, pick a vice chair, a secretary, and a treasurer. And uh, just for a little background for some of the newer members, um, we try to set up this committee where it represents diversity of the various stakeholders and so typically we've had somebody from zone one, somebody from zone two, a merchant and UCLA so that all of the various uh, groups within the, the village are represented. Um, based on precedent from our previous elections we will consider each officer position separately um, so we won't have a slate it'll be uh, seat by seat uh, so we'll have a, a motion, a second, and a vote. Um, if more than one member wants to serve in the officer positions, I'll ask for a show of hands in advance to determine the support. Uh, we'll do, I guess, what we call a straw poll. Uh, and then uh, we'll figure it out from there what we, how the process goes. Uh, we'll start with vice chair, and secretary, and then treasurer. Uh, you can nominate yourself or others can nominate you. If you get nominated and you don't want to serve, you don't have to. You can <laughs> reject the nomination. And the officer terms will be uh, two year terms, January 20th, or January 2020 until December 31st, 2021. Um, as far as secretary and treasurer, you don't have to be scared about it. Nobody's taking notes. Um, and uh, we have a full time accountant who takes care of our books. So uh, you might get dragged into signing some checks, but. The name is much more intimidating than uh, what you need to do. And uh, to start, uh, Brad Erickson is our current vice chair representing UCLA. And uh, I guess I'll start by asking Brad, are you interested in continuing to serve your position as vice chair? Absolutely. If the board feels uh, that you value on, happy to serve. Okay. All right. Is there anybody else that uh, would like to make a nomination or self nominate? Happy to be secretary. Um, we're at, at this point. We're just on uh, vice chair. Oh. Okay. So. Oh, I appreciate um, your enthusiasm. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, do we have a second for? Uh, I, okay. So I'll nominate Brad to serve as vice chair. Do I have a second? I'll second. Second. Okay. Um, do we need public comment or not? Yes. Steve, did you have anything to say? The only question I'd say, and not to Brad, but to every candidate for any office, do folks plan to be here for the duration? Because I think you just announced it's a two-year term from January 1, 2020 through December 2022. And I don't know if everybody is going to be there to serve. And you know, maybe people would want to know if somebody's not going to be, then that's fine too. But I, just, I do think that that's a question that should be asked of all the candidates. Second, um, is, there, is there an answer to that question? I have no plans to. Uh, I, I may, I may not stay with UCLA that whole time, but right now I have no plans. No specific plans have been made. Okay. So, any questions? Okay. So motion second. I guess we have a vote. Yeah, but right. We already have a motion. Uh, Kevin and then Jessica seconded. So I'll be voting. I'll be This is for Brad. <clears throat> so all in favor? Aye. Congratulations, Thank Brad. <clears throat> okay, moving along to uh, secretary. Um, 
So I think on this one, we're, it sounds like we're going to have a straw poll. Um, I was planning to nominate Matt, uh, who's new to the board, representing the Topa seat. And uh, he's been busy working on uh, trying to fill that uh, Topa vacancy. And they're the largest uh, property owner, I think, in the village in Zone 1, correct? Yes. Um, and so Topa has historically had a, a seat on this committee. And I think that Matt would be um, a, uh, a great uh, person to have in that seat to help uh, shape policy. Um, so Matt, if you're up for it, I'd like to nominate you. Sure. OK. And then I think uh, we might have another self-nomination. Uh, you know what, I'll, I'll withdraw my nomination. It's just I remember the last time Secretary came up, nobody wanted to do it. <laughs> 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 and uh, Katisha reluctantly you know, nominated herself. So you know, I'm, I'm happy to have Topa there. That's the right move, actually. OK. All right, public comment. Um, yeah, I will say, John, I'm personally disappointed. Um, I would say that, no disrespect to Matt at all, but I believe this is Matt's very first board meeting attending. I think he attended the annual meeting as well, but was not able to attend previous meetings. I think to put somebody on the executive committee who is literally brand new, basically as new almost as John, when you have experienced board members who have attended meetings and have the context of the organization and with past issues and future issues and also you know, and I'm not trying to single out John because there's others as well, but John has stepped up to leadership, chairing the bar committee ably for a year or two or more. I do think there's a value in experience, and I think there's a value. Um, and folks on, on the board have the same vote. I mean, it doesn't disrespect people that they're not on the executive committee because ultimately all decisions have to come to the board anyway. But I do think that there's a value in having people with experience with the organization taking those leadership positions. So that's just a comment that I would, I would make and for that, not just for this seat, but for all the officers. I do think that having that experience is valued. And you know, I know, Brad, you're nodding your head because you know that things come up and you understand there's context to things that an issue may come up, but it might have come up two years earlier or something. And having that, 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 that perspective is valuable. Thank you. Thanks, Steve. OK, so do uh, I have a second for Matt? I'll second. All in favor? All right. Welcome, Matt. Congratulations. <laughs> okay. Um, treasurer is the final officer seat to, to fill. Kevin, I would like to nominate Peter for this um, position. Um, Peter is, as everybody knows, a merchant who would and that would nicely round out the uh, representation on the executive committee. Peter has served on this board since uh, January 2014, so to Steve's point. Other than myself, Peter is the longest serving board member sitting at this table. And uh, Peter has a lot of personal experience uh, being a lawyer and a restaurateur. And with this board and with Westwood Village in general, I think Peter has proven over and over again his love and dedication to this village. And I think he would be an excellent voice to add to the executive committee and also be very ably, um, be very able and uh, terrific at the church of job. I second that nomination. Thank you. Can we have a second? Uh, Anybody else want to say? Circling back, I would like to nominate John Hank for this position as well. Um, I think Peter's great. Um, I don't know. Uh, but uh, I've, I've enjoyed working with John and under John on the board that I serve on. And um, I really appreciate his guidance and leadership. And I think that uh, he would bring a really strong perspective uh, to the executive board. And I'd like to see him. Do you accept that nomination? <clears throat> Uh, no, I think I think I'd rather see Peter as a merchant. On the, you know, I'm not a merchant. I certainly, you know, I'm, I'm a finance guy and I understand everything about <coughs> balance sheets and income statements and everything in between general ledgers. But I know Peter does as well. So I, I mean, I don't think I, I bring anything special in terms of you know my ownership of real estate in the village and my management of real estate in the village. So I think it's the right choice. Okay. Thanks, John. 
All right. So do we have a second to Peter's nomination? Yeah, I second. I second. All right. All right. All right. All right. Oh, oh, sorry. Jumping ahead. Any comments, Steve? Yeah, I will make a comment, and that is, it kind of seems that this was all predetermined, to be fr quite frank with you, you know, and I do want to comment on an earlier statement that was made, Kevin, and that was, and again, I don't mean to be singling out Topa at all, so please, it's not about you, Matt, but to say that Topa's always been on or whatever, that's, that's just not true, that's, there's nothing in your bylaws that say that I, and I do think that having the distribution of the different areas, zone one, zone two, is, that's also not in your bylaws, that's actually something that, I think I commented in favor of a number of years ago. I think that's valuable. But I think it's unfortunate because um, there does seem to be, and I've seen this, this pattern of there's certain folks that we want to make sure are in these positions, and that's kind of what's happening today. And there's maybe people with different voices that don't seem to be as welcomed, and that's unfortunate. Um, so I'm just going to make that comment. And I would just say about Peter, I know him, and he's a very able guy. I just will make an observation. I know Peter is a busy guy, and I know he generally lives far away. I know, Peter, oftentimes your attendance at these meetings is not 100%, or when you arrive, you do arrive sometimes late. So I would just say, if you are going to be on the executive committee, I hope you will have the time to commit, because I know you're doing many things ably. But I just would make that comment. <coughs> Just in response, I just renewed my lease for another five years here. Um, I am winding down my practice a lot. I'm in it for the end. That's for right. sure. Great. I, I'd like to point out there were multiple nominations for both, and they were both turned down. So it wasn't just one person was nominated. John was nominated for two different seats. He turned them both down. So there was an option for others to be nominated and voted on, and they declined. So, and secondly, I think. Matt being a new member and Peter being uh, an old member just adds diversity to our board and our executive uh, council, and so I, I think it's great. Thanks, Josh. Sorry, may I also just make a Please. quick comment? I would just like to say, as a new board member, I feel very welcome. Um, I do not take it personally at all that I was not nominated for anything. Um, <laughs> and I think that uh, to say that anything that's predetermined is these people do not deserve what they've gotten for any reason, be it where they work, who they are, or when they started this board, is uh, ridiculous. And I'm ridiculous very happy to see where this is going. All right. So we have a nomination in the second, right? Correct. All right. Let's vote. All in favor? Congratulations. Well, well, you vote yourself. <laughs> Welcome. I'm Dr. Luther. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Okay, next item on the agenda is, um, uh, it came up in the executive committee uh, last Friday that uh, Andrew's contract expires at the end of 2020. And the executive committee oversees personnel matters, and uh, we'd like to begin negotiating with Andrew to extend his contract. Um, I want to ask for committee uh, authorization to begin the negotiation. And then the committee would return to the full board, uh, likely in the first quarter of 2020, hopefully, it's not going to be contentious, uh, to have the contract approved. Can I ask a question? Yes. Um, in terms of the executive committee's due diligence on this item, are you looking at other bids and what other executive directors are being paid and what other executive directors are receiving in terms of uh, increases in salary and those kinds of, of things. I mean, Andy's doing a great job. I don't have any doubt about that. But I think, you know, due diligence is important. I'd just like to understand it. Sure. We can certainly do that. Um, Douglas Emmett is a large contributor to the Santa Monica Business Improvement District. Um, and so I'm happy to uh, figure out their compensation practices um, and look at that. Uh, they have the benefit of a substantially larger um, budget than we do, and so I suspect that their director has paid more. But um, sure. Let's say with Hollywood. But uh, we can definitely do some diligence on that as part of it. Kevin, can I jump in here for yeah. a moment just to say that historically, John, we have done exactly that. The executive committee, which I've had the privilege to serve on for a while, um, has always done that before negotiating Andrew's salary. has. Um, uh, called together that information from 
uh, other bids and has done a comparison uh, based on bid size and bid funds and the director of compensation. So, as Kevin said, it's not always apples to apples because the Santa Monica bid has a, uh, a much larger income than, than, than we do, but um, it still provides a basis of comparison. So that has always been done in the past, and I'm sure the executive committee will do that again this time. Anybody else have any other comments? All right, Steve, so about the comment? Uh, you no, that's fine. Yes, we do. Um, thank you. Um, I would say, first of all, and again, no disrespect to Andrew, but procedurally, Mr. Chairman, I would think that when you're discussing anything related to the compensation of your staff member, the proper thing to do is to ask that staff member to excuse themselves because, it, you know, just imagine in your own companies, if you're deciding what to give your CFO or your director of marketing, you typically want to have that in a confidential setting, and I think it does, having the individual, the employee, sitting there right in the room, it chills the conversation because people may not feel free to say everything. I mean, I don't feel super comfortable saying what I'm saying right now because it could easily this be misperceived and I think generally what you've done in the past is when you go into any discussion about the compensation executive director of the contract, they're excused from the room. So I would just make that point. But I don't mind saying this in front of Andrew because there's no secrets and I'm, I'm not saying anything incendiary, but for the future, I'd like to suggest that that's the process that I think has been the way Jessica did it and others did it as well. I and mean, I just think that's best practice. Um, the issue of the executive director of compensation is one of the most important issues because this is, I think, next to your contract for your clean safe, which is like 70% of your budget, this is maybe your next biggest item. And I do agree that Jessica, in the past, the first year, I know the, the executive committee did a very diligent job of doing comparisons. I've never seen evidence that that ever happened after that. Um, maybe it has, but it certainly was not shared with the public. Um, the position. I believe has gone to seen about a 50% increase in salary. I believe it started out at around 100,000 approximately when this position started in 2011 or 12, and I think it's now north of 150,000. I don't know of too many people in the public sector that have seen a 50% increase in their salary, and I definitely don't know too many people in the nonprofit sector that have seen a 50% increase in their salary over a seven or eight year period. And Andrew does a very good job, but I would say that maybe his salary goals have reached or exceeded the capacity of a relatively small bid. Maybe it's a point that Andrew should be running a bigger bid like Santa Monica that has three times the budget, or Hollywood that has about four times the budget, or downtown LA that has maybe five or six, I mean seven million dollar budget. We are a relatively small bid, and none of this really is discussed. And on the last point I want to make, I'm really surprised to see that this executive committee recommendation of a 10% bonus and a 4% in, um, uh, increase in annual salary was not even subject to a board vote. It was just included in minutes, never discussed. That is not the way I think salary and executive compensation should be handled with two or three people and then it's just put in a set of minutes. Um, in the past, the board has discussed these items because it is a very important item. This, year, this is tax collected money that you're spending. It's not your own private company. It's not Starwood's money or Pebblebrook money or Douglas Emmett's money. This is tax collected money and it, it generally is held to a more transparent standard. Thank you. So, can we point of information? Yeah. I, I'm a little confused about exactly what it is that we're discussing here mm -hmm. because it sounds like you guys have already negotiated what you think. No. So what is, uh, no. what is the 10% no. and the, the bonus and 4%? Those are two different issues. The, the, Salary determination was something related to this year. Next year, Andrew's contract expires. And this item is solely about uh, that I would like the executive committee to have the ability to negotiate his contract and bring it to the board. Okay, so I, I don't remember in the past us as a board ever having to authorize the executive committee to do that? Am I just not remembering that? Well, it would have been four years ago. Okay. Um, and so, Got it. Uh, but, but you're right. Um, so, so what, what's being asked of us right now is to authorize you guys to negotiate it, not to finalize any decisions. It will, it does it absolutely will, have to come back to the board. It absolutely will come back to the board. Okay. But I, I think that, um, I think that four people negotiating should give us enough representation to make sure that we don't screw something up, and then we can bring it back to the larger board for discussion and approval. So, okay. so to what's 
the public was making comments that we are not negotiating his contract here. Absolutely not. Right, so that had nothing, okay. So Thank you. Just looking for authorization for the executive committee to negotiate it. I, I would Thank say, and it's rare that I agree with Mr. Sand, but I, if we were to negotiate his contract, I do think Andrew should not be present while we do that. I think that's protocol. That's, 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 that's not for sure what One hundred percent. I feel comfortable yeah. asking for authorization to negotiate, okay. and we will not be negotiating. Okay. Right. Uh, All right. So, so the executive committee is going to make a recommendation to the board, essentially, at yes. the end of the day. Okay. That, that, I, I would say that that would be fun. I, I'll make a motion to approve this. Okay. Do I have a second? All in favor? Aye. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Next item. Um, Andrew? Excellent. Uh, thanks, Kevin. And thanks, Claire and Genevieve uh, from Haynes & Co. who are here. So if I could give a little background on this item. Um, about midway last year, maybe early into last year, um, we started internally as a staff having conversations about uh, the messaging of our organization and, uh, and our, our pretty strong feeling that if, um, you know, one way or the other you're being defined. You're either defining yourself or somebody else is defining you. And uh, um, I feel like uh, with what's happening here with the metro construction coming up uh, with the Olympics, you know, subway portals are going to be opening. Uh, you know, the specific plan uh, amendments for the vacancy that we have here. You know, there's definitely a story being told about Westwood, but uh, but our feeling was, well, we don't we don't um, really have uh, um, our message really grounded in who we are, and, and uh, we're not really talking about the things that we want to share with our public. So we reached out to some other business improvement districts, and they uh, told us they worked with uh, Claire and Genevieve from Haynes and Co. or company? Yeah, Haynes Co. Yeah. Okay, and and, uh, um, and they came and presented to the bar committee and really informed us what they had done for these other business improvement districts uh, in terms of messaging. And uh, we thought it was it was interesting. We didn't have a forum at that meeting, but we did feel during the discussion this was very important for the board to be able to weigh in on. Um, to see if this type of messaging is something that we think is important and that we want to uh, to try to proceed with. So, um, is that about summarizing? Yeah. Um, so, uh, so with that, I guess uh, um, we have a laptop set up for you guys, and you guys emailed us a presentation. I know, so I can introduce Genevieve and Claire uh, from Hainton. Hi, everybody. Thank you for being here this morning. I appreciate sure. it. <clears throat> Um, I guess the timing we, is perfect too. <laughs> well, that means you to be in the right place at the right time. Um, so standing here is good? Sure. Okay. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Genevieve Haynes. I uh, work with Haynes & Co. Uh, I specialize in uh, public relations and digital outreach. And I'm with Claire. And I'll let Claire introduce herself. Yeah. I'm uh, Claire Spades. I'm a brand strategist and a um, marketing communications professional um, and I have a lot of background in place-based brands so that has included recently some work with bids which is really interesting exciting work to I'm a lifetime Angelina so I care a lot about what happens in Los Angeles um, and I've also worked on the developer side. So I've worked with clients including Crusoe, Center Cal Properties, DJM Capital who just acquired Hollywood and Highland, working on that project now. So um, I spend a lot of time thinking about how people relate to places and how the right mix of ideas and involvement from stakeholders and monitoring trends all sort of can coalesce into really powerful positioning for places. And so this is the conversation we're having about Westwood. And we're excited to be here and sort of present to you an approach. Um, yeah, Claire mentioned we worked with bids for about the last six and a half years. We've been working with bids uh, for Hollywood and for the Fashion District. And we'll talk a little bit about the work that we did for them. And we actually were introduced uh, through a California Downtown Association presentation. And I think some of those things that we talked about really resonated with what we know about Westwood and what we've heard meeting with staff about Westwood. And Westwood is very uh, close in our hearts. Uh, both of Claire's parents are UCLA alums. I worked at UCLA over at Wilshire Center um, for a 
a while I was director of integrated communication for uh, uh, UCLA, and so this is a place that we spend a lot of time and we care about. So we'll go ahead and walk through the presentation. We're going to first talk a little bit about the kinds of things that Andrew and Megan have, uh, we've heard from them as far as what might make sense for Westwood. And then we'll go through two examples. We'll go through how we worked with Hollywood and then also how we worked with the fashion district. So when we're looking at uh, what is possible for a community, a lot of times there's, uh, we kind of compare it to a place like The Grove. There's uh, one owner, there's a master plan, this shop goes here, this shop goes there, we know where we're going. In places like Westwood and Fashion District and Hollywood, there are dozens of property owners, and some are new and some are legacy, some uh, are, have a clear vision of where they want to go, but they can't control what their neighbor does. And so part of what we've done in working with this is brought, convened people to talk about what a future might look like and how growth or change can be intentional and it can be clearly communicated to lots of different stakeholders, whether it's current or prospective tenants or leasing agents or stakeholders like uh, uh, government officials. And so what we're looking at with um, the Fashion District in Hollywood is putting all that together into a really clear vision. So uh, that kind of goes across leasing, design, programming, sponsorship, and communication. And so we spent a lot of time and we heard a lot of things from Westwood, uh, the Improvement Association, and Claire's going to talk through what we heard. Right. So we always start with what's the current situation, what's happening on the streets today, um, what's, what makes us worried about that, what makes us excited about that. Um, the current situation for Westwood is that you have a lot of competing destinations. People have lots of choices with where to go and where to spend their time. Um, and a lot of those um, properties have spent a lot of investment dollars making their properties right and trying to reattract audiences that maybe they lost or expand their offerings. So it's an important piece of the mix. Um, vacancies in any bid are challenges because they telegraph that maybe things aren't quite right. Why, why am I walking past empty buildings? Nobody likes to be on a streetscape and walk past empty buildings. It doesn't feel right. It doesn't enhance the streetscape. It takes away from it. Um, bright spots and news about the village is somewhat lacking in the public and, um, and media conversations. So you're not hearing a lot of news out of Westwood. Um, and yet you have a wealth of cultural assets, art assets, um, educational assets that link very, in very interesting ways. So there certainly is an opportunity to amplify that. Um, the district strengths, though, also exist. You have easy transit access. It's a highly walkable district. You don't have to get in your car to cross the street like Angelina's like to do. Um, there's adjacency to UCLA. It's a phenomenal institution. It is growing all the time. Part of that growth is um, has provided some problems for you, too, though, because they have all their food services on campus. And so those students who used to populate Westwood, if you talk to my mom, for the 50s in UCLA, they were in Western Village all the time. That was where they ate and dined and were entertained and saw movies. Um, so the campus turning in on itself can be a challenge, and it's something that I think we can work to resolve. And then there's affluent surrounding communities. I mean, you are beautifully positioned. Um, if we were to look at your trade area, it is certainly affluent. There's certainly disposable income, so we need to give those people reasons to come here and spend their money as opposed to going into Beverly Hills going into Century City, going to Santa Monica. And then finally, um, the stinger is that you're going to have a major metro project, which is going to make it difficult to get around. And um, so one of the things we've talked about is how do we make Westwood Village an oasis during that time, particularly for the locals who are accustomed to moving in and out, but who may decide to stay here because they, it's simply too hard to move around. Um, Okay, so we heard this, and Andrew, you just said this, you know, the message is out there. Do we control the message or let it control us? We're brand new people. We want to control the message. Yeah. So that's our job is to talk about how we do that, how we don't let things just happen from external forces, but how we use our internal resources to change that conversation. And that was very much how we started the process with Hollywood, which Jenna will talk about in a second. It was clear that Hollywood needed to change the conversation about Hollywood. And it takes time to do that. We worked with them for seven years. It's a work in progress. It will probably continue to be a work in progress. Um, but I think it's a really important reason why we're having this conversation today. 
and then um, how we can help. So we really have divided this into a three-pronged engagement. Um, and so the first is to create a shared vision that's rooted in research. If any of you follow the Project for Public Spaces, you know that one of the important steps in any place-based project is getting the input of the stakeholders. Those stakeholders include customers, they include board members, they include tenants, they include property owners. So we take all of that and then we create a shared vision. We don't look at vision as a statement, though. We look at vision as a very multi-dimensional um, proposition. It isn't just going to be encapsulated in a sentence. It's going to be encapsulated in a whole lot of things that we need and want to do to make Westwood Village um, on par with other districts and with other retail destinations within the city. Um, then we move into strategy and marketing positioning, market positioning. So that's how we're going to get there, the roadmap for the future. And positioning, I think, is important. Why Westwood over somewhere else? Why are you different? Why are you special? And there, you know, when I look at Westwood, I see amazing things. In addition to the art and culture, you have some beautiful architecture. And I think some of it's just getting masked by people's sort of um, predispositions and, and perceptions about what it is. And, we can sort of help to pull that away and really help people see Westwood with a beautiful community that it is. And then finally, we um, synthesize all of that into a vision book that is used as a marketing tool. So it's not just doing a vision book that sits down a shelf and collects dust. It's an active, dynamic, living document. It's taken out to, um, we find that property owners often use it with real estate agents, with um, prospective tenants, with other property owners. So it's really about giving you a tool that you can communicate your vision out to the world in really compelling ways. It's delivered as a digital asset. Um, it can be printed. It can be navigated through really simple hyperlinking and other functionality. So it's a very useful tool. And, um, and we'll look at how we did it for, less, um, for the fashion district in a second so you can see what we mean. So uh, going into our first of two examples, uh, this is uh, Fashion District. We worked with them uh, when they had a um, real pain point in their uh, marketing. And they are 110 blocks in downtown Los Angeles, giant, and there are a lot of different things happening in there and a lot of change happening. Uh, and their job, what they wanted to do is uh, banner, street banners. And they uh, went in very excited about street banners, and then nobody could agree on what should go in the street banners. Uh, they ended up having to stop that project and take a step back and say, hey, what are we about? What is our brand? What are we trying to tell people about who we are? And uh, so when we came in, uh, we are, were charged with helping them come up with their DNA, their brand, and their story. Uh, so that then the other pieces could come in line a lot easier. If they understood who they were, what their visual identity was, then each piece could get easier going along. So that's what we came in. We were told, uh, don't change the logo. We love the logo. So um, <coughs> and I'll let Claire talk through the process. And then the logo. <laughs> <laughs> so as we unearthed what was happening in the fashion district, um, first of all, I love fashion. So this was like such a fun job because Fashion is happening there. I mean, what's so cool about the fashion district is it's legit, it's authentic. It's, and it's not that it's a manufacturing capital anymore, but it is a design capital. And, and all of the attendant services and businesses and people who are part of the industry broadly, and fashion including floral, including fabric and textile, and including streetwear and, and wearable fashion, all sort of populate there. But when we showed people, as we started to interview people about their perceptions of the district, the logo <coughs> would never come up. And we heard this remarkable thing. People didn't like the logo. They didn't think the logo represented them anymore. I call this the pretty woman logo, because it reminds me of Julia Roberts on Rodeo <laughs> Drive in the movie. Um, and you're never going to see that woman in the Los Angeles fashion <laughs> district. It's just not going to happen. Um, what you're going to see are hipsters, and you're going to see people searching for bargains, and you're going to see people like wanting to go to cool restaurants, and you're going to see people lined up outside the door at Sonora Town. It is very, that is the reality. And what you are struck with is the amount of color and vibrance in the fashion district. So, ta-da, <laughs> we redid the fashion district logo. And what we did is we created sort of this geometry, creating sort of physical structure out of the L.A., 
um, with these overlapping colors to tell this story that we are the most sort of diverse and authentically colorful district in Los Angeles and gave them a much more powerful presence. And guess what? When we went to do street banners, it took about five minutes <laughs> because we had such a powerful visual language. And if you click to the next slide, you'll start to see how this sort of pulled its way through. So they were already doing a really remarkable job with their Instagram feed, but this just sort of empowered them even further to like, where do we find the color? Where, how do we amplify that? Um, how do things like walking maps, how do things like how we tell our story and data points and infographics, how do we show up and how do we give enough flexibility to the logo? I'm not a fan of logos that are completely locked and you can never, ever, ever change them. They can never be interpreted because it's not realistic for today's climate. What is it going to look like in an Instagram tiny little circle? And what's it going to look like on a website and in digital and in print? and in banner programs. So we really worked to create a very flexible program that is decidedly fashion district, but not narrowly just this one mark, because it represents something so much bigger than that. Um, and they were great at deploying the fashion district. I mean, immediately the shirts changed on all of their street ambassadors, and I mean, and trash cans. Like, Genevieve and I like to walk through Hollywood and, and take pictures of trash cans that we've logoized. Now. <laughs> it's so exciting that I never thought I'd do a trash can. <laughs> then, so the next, there. Uh, after that project was done, uh, we met with some uh, property owners who had, um, uh, they've been on the, in the district for generations, and they were tracking uh, development in downtown. So they could kind of see that Broadway was uh, becoming a, a very different Broadway, and they looked at the next street over was Los Angeles Street, where their buildings were, and they saw an opportunity to create a vision for what that street would look like. What they didn't want was a haphazard uh, changing of tenants and uh, a ecosystem that didn't really work for the neighborhood or for the neighbors. And so uh, they had the idea, they came to us to help create a um, marketing book for the street. So what we ended up doing was uh, we did a charrette with them, we did a lot of research in the community, we did uh, demographic research, and it culminated in a brochure that they wanted to, the reason, real reason they wanted the brochure is that they would go to leasing agents and the leasing agents would say, I don't see it. And you, you guys can't get great tenants here. It's not going to happen. And they said, you're not seeing what we're seeing. And so that was the impetus behind creating this brochure that then could be share the vision with other people. And it's actually started to work. You can see people, all the property owners on the street in the beginning going, I don't see it. I don't see where it's going. And now the property owners are like, all right, I get it. <laughs> it really coalesced around the vision. So we'll let um, Claire talk about the different parts of it. Right. So. Um, one of the important things you do when you take a look at a community then is you look at who's here, who's living here, who's working here, who's coming here for nightlife, who's coming here for lunch. So we did a lot of work at looking at the creative community. And that, and it, that is a unique thing about the fashion district is just the amount of creative energy that lives and works there. But it's really important and I think it means that those are people who are, if you look at it in um, sort of psychographic terms, people will talk about the cultural creatives. And cultural creatives are people who are open to trying new things, they care about the environment, they care about the quality of their food. Um, and so we really wanted to capture that because it was going to be important to people sort of self-selecting Los Angeles Street because they knew that that customer was going to, their business was going to resonate with that customer. So we talked a lot about that and then we go ahead and click. Then we looked at the power of that residential community, and that's ever-growing. I'm mean, much like Hollywood, there's just a constant influx of new residents. Their population is expanding annually. Um, and so millennials are making up 42% of residents, 69% are between the ages of 19 and 49. Um, art, design, entertainment, and sports media are all just a small sampling of the creative businesses. And one of the things that's interesting about Los Angeles Fashion District is what was happening from the second floor up was way more interesting than what was happening at the street level, which was interesting. So how do we get that energy and excitement of everything happening on those upper floors down to the street level? It also um, did not hurt that the California Market Center is being dramatically redone and is going to open to the street. So you're seeing this, I, and we've talked about the hammer in this context. 
that these large institutional buildings that once they felt they needed to turn in to give people a sense of safety and security are now going to turn out to the street. And that changes everything. And Los Angeles Street really then for us, because of the combination of uses, residential, office, ground level retail, showrooms, the four most iconic fashion buildings are on Los Angeles Street at the intersection of Los Angeles and Ninth. What we realized is this has the potential to be the most walkable corridor through the fashion district. The scale is right, the width of the street is right, it's tree lined. So all the things were starting to come together, but nobody was telling the story. And so what we really focus on is telling that story. And then finally, we talk about sense of place. And so this is where we really engaged. And through the charrette process, what we did is we did brainstorm. So what would a Los Angeles street look like? What needs to happen? And the overwhelming sensibility um, or sense from everyone was there needs to be more cohesion from end to end of the street. And we were only dealing with about five to six blocks of the Los Angeles street before it turns one direction going south towards the 110 freeway, and then it moves into the historic district at the other end. So um, it's a very manageable thing, but creating cohesion, so things like lighting, street lights, um, events that could happen on the street. You know, my, my fantasy dream is someday they'll do a giant runway show down the center of Los Angeles Street during a fashion week. And that's the other thing, they're pulling in people all the time from all over the country who shop the markets. And we needed to give those people a better experience of Los Angeles Street too, because I think you see a lot of these, you know, people who come from Texas and the Midwest and Atlanta and who get to the fashion district and like, where am I? And where is safe? And where do I have dinner? And so we needed to find those ways to telegraph, hey, you're good. This is a great place to be. And, and, and if you're going to come here, stay here. Because the worst thing that happens to the fashion district, right, is you pull all these people in and then they go somewhere else for dinner at night. We wanted to give them reasons to stay. So the other case study we'll walk through is um, for Hollywood. And one thing that we found with Hollywood is that a lot of people think about Hollywood the way it was um, maybe in the 80s. Uh, and I'm sure all people who are in the room who are been in LA for a while can think about what that means and but at the same time uh, Hollywood right now is undergoing an incredible uh, development boom so there's two stories there's the story that's in everybody's head about what Hollywood is and then there's the story about how things have changed and so with, when we went to Hollywood uh, six years ago uh, that second story wasn't being told and we talked about it in two ways one is make Hollywood visible and relevant because if you're not visible you're invisible and secondly, uh, change the conversation. That people are talking about Hollywood this way, we want to tell them the story about the bright spots, the exciting things happening in the neighborhood, the things that are coming. And so through a media relations campaign that came out of our initial branding work with them, we ended up, uh, over the course of six years, you can go to the next slide, you can start to see some things that have happened. So we did a similar infographic uh, and shared it widely, and it ended up in the Los Angeles Times. Uh, where instead of having stories about once dreary Hollywood, <laughs> talking about a uh, huge uh, increase in housing. And so that's an important story for local business leaders. Uh, and this came straight out of the, the initial branding work we did for them. On the next slide, you can see um, uh, Coin, this is a local paper where a lot of local people would be coming to uh, Hollywood, and they say it's uh, changing from uh, dicier establishments to a young, hip place to be. Now that's a great message for uh, the uh, well to be <laughs> own, uh, readers of the Larchmont Buzz. And coming from them, uh, it, it's a very compelling story. And the next one, uh, we did outreach uh, through meetings today. So um, a large uh, groups coming to uh, choosing Hollywood for their meetings. Uh, today, Hollywood has a more sophisticated nightlife scene. So this all comes from our changing the story. It's not this anymore. Here it is. In the next slide, two decades ago, the place was uh, tattoo parlors, but now stylish newcomers are opening nonstop. So you can kind of track, we call it message penetration. How, do, how far does your message get through to the media? And you can see the story about changing the conversation keeps coming up, even the headline, the new old Hollywood. So when we look at some of the challenges, uh, Westwood is its own unique animal. It's a very special place. It's a special place for all of us when we think back 
through our times in UCLA or times in the neighborhood. Uh, and, but it has some of the same challenges that we talked about in the beginning, and just the same way Hollywood had challenges and the fashion district had challenges. And coming together to uh, build a vision for where we want to go, we think has been very effective in these other organizations. And I think that's why when we did the presentation at CDA that it really resonated with um, staff. Uh, and we would be, we're again, big fans of Westwood, so this would be kind of a dream project for us to work with you guys on is we think we could do some really exciting things uh, using some of our experiences for the other kids. Yes? I have a question for you. You sure. had a slide a few back about percentages. I think it was had percentages of... Uh, <coughs> yeah, there. Uh, two things. One, um, you know, I think it was Mark Twain who famously said there's lies, damn lies, and statistics. <laughs> anyway, uh, it, statistics out of context from a real estate standpoint are uh, they're important, but they, and they grab you. For example, a 37% bachelor's degree. I guess the question for me would be relative to what? In other words, if I'm a, a tenant looking to relocate, mm -hmm. um, I want to know. You know, it's it's not. You know, it might be yes, but that's the same as as. The entire area. Or, yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So, so I, I would and I would say that having context in your back pocket for anything like this is, is helpful. But for Westwood, and I just want to, I know I'm getting a little granular here. If you're look, looking at the demographics, we talked about this, and you look at the people with PhDs and the, uh, you know, apart from maybe the student population, the local income levels, it's extraordinary. Yeah. So typically, you know, real estate investors, as Kevin knows, one of the first things you, you zero in on is, is you know, area demographics. And by that measure, Westwood should be thriving in a way that it, ha it is not and has not for some time. So I think for us, for me, the central challenge which you, you might have is to figure out, you know, how do, you sh how do, you, how do we, some, how, what, what are we missing? What's missing here? A lot of people have a lot of opinions about that. I think there's a lot of factors. We're working on all of them, I think. But in your engagement, for us, if that occurs, um, it seems to me that uh, you're going to need to tease out how to capture things that we maybe it's audiences, maybe it's feet, maybe you know, shoppers that, that we should. You know, the big question for me is why isn't it more vibrant than, than its numbers would suggest? You know, one of the things that came up in the last conversation that we had, I had spent um, a bunch of time in Evanston. <laughs> this summer. My daughter was doing a summer program at Northwestern for theater. And one of the things that has happened in Westwood is that the obvious thing to do was to compare yourself to the other local communities, right, or to the Century City property. One of the things that hasn't been looked at, I don't believe, is how college towns figure this out. So Evanston is a great example. It is a great example of mixed use. And I'm not talking about just mixed use in real estate terms. I'm talking about mixed use as in a professor and his wife can go to a lovely restaurant and walk into a beautiful residential neighborhood on their way home. And a college student can be at Colectivo, which is their like hip local coffee brand, and have breakfast with friends. And all of it is coexisting in a really amazing, vibrant way. And I think that's true of other college towns as well, and that's a good one. So one of the things that I would want to do in, as part of the audit when we look at this community is look at successful college towns because I think it's inevitable that Westwood is so <coughs> tethered to UCLA in so many respects. And figuring out how the college town um, has that that air of intellectualism and creativity and innovation and is serving a lot of different populations from everything from students to professors to maybe alum who are coming for an event. How do we address the complexion of this community, not just in terms of straight up household incomes, disposable incomes, but also their, their attitude and why they're here and why this is should be a really inspiring, intellectually um, inspiring place to be. So it's just something that came up for me, and I and and we, then we talked about some other college towns that we also think do a good job. So that would be one area I'd like to pursue. You know, that I would want to pursue um, because I think it's unique to 
to Westwood, and nobody else can claim that I think in Los you're Angeles. Right I mean, I, I've been baffled at how lame it is. <laughs> and I mean, <laughs> I mean, University of Wisconsin has State Street. Yep. University of Colorado has Pearl Street. Yep. University of Washington has a great district. Beautiful. I mean, it. it they should be. Uh, you know, there should be some symbiosis between the two areas, right. and there's just not. Even, yeah. even Telegraph Avenue in Berkeley is looking better these days. Right. <laughs> uh, yeah. It's when, when Telegraph Avenue starts to look better, it's like, oh man, we, got yeah. <laughs> we have work to do. <laughs> have work to do. Yeah. But there are barriers. Uh, literally, there are barriers. There are physical barriers. Um, you know, and I used to think there were perhaps some changes, some sort of demographic barriers in some ways in terms of the changing student population. But if you look at what's happened, you know, the areas around, especially Berkeley again, uh, not a dissimilar demographic, and yet the college town feel of Berkeley has, uh, is much more vibrant yes. than, uh, and Berkeley's worked hard to, to improve on that. But um, I, I'd say that our challenge is not really demographic, so I'm really, I, I'm not sure what exactly it is, but I think it needs to be better. There's a lot of things that need to change. Sure. I, I think, um, not, and this is not the place to get into all of them. No, I don't. <laughs> we have a very interesting interplay of a world-class hospital, yep. world-class university, yep. outstanding real estate, large office buildings, and a very affluent community, and yet we're next to a college campus. And the college student of this generation is fundamentally different than the college students that I remember, even from my own sons who went to school 10 years ago. They're not going out. And, and what I'm just curious about is, how do you envision, what is your overall vision for the village that can help integrate all of these different competing influences within a framework that can work for everybody? Right. You know, there's, like you said, this isn't a monolithic economic structure. There are plenty of business owners, all with their different needs. What do you see as the future of the village? I think um, happening, I think programming has a lot to do with it. Um, what's, why would a student come down here? What's happening you know, that would make them come down here? And I don't necessarily mean bars, which obviously could possibly pull some kids down. <laughs> but I do think that programming, they, they I think these kids, I have a daughter who's 17, so applying to college right now. So um, I think these kids crave to have social things. They just don't think anything is serving them and their needs and their interests. And how do we, how do we crack that? If she, she does come, she goes to Marymount High School, so she is more than the average teen in Westwood, you know. But there isn't a lot for her here. I mean, there's an ice cream store, and there's Starbucks, and but then what? You know, how do we scratch the the surface of that and find, you know, a way to sort of combine um, what's going to be interesting to? Because we're not even talking about millennials now. These are Gen Z. These are kids are digital natives. They have no no life prior to a cell phone, and and they don't. You are right. They do not go out as much. My high schoolers don't go out as much as I was out all the time, <laughs> often in Westwood, <laughs> to my mother's chagrin. Um, so, because they feel connected to one another all the time. So how do we create, but what I do think they seek out is novelty. I think that they want things, that novel experiences give them social currency, and then they can share that social currency on their social platforms. So, so and to that point, so, what are you suggesting? Ad campaigns? Um, yeah, I know you talked about a book. You guys maybe want to make a Western Village handbook, put up signs. I mean, what do you think is going to draw them? Sending out email blasts? Having an app? I mean, what, what were the practical branding yeah. uses yeah. you're going to utilize? So part of what, our, what we do is that we come in with kind of an outside perspective. We bring perspectives from other business recruitment districts and from uh, uh, retail, like, Caruso and other properties like that, and we try to um, listen to what local stakeholders say, right? And I think you said that there's a lot of different people, constituencies, a lot of different, you have office buildings, you have residential, you have students, you have uh, visitors and parents, and how do you, and then the, the wealthier, the affluent neighborhoods around it. 
So listening to those different uh, constituencies and teasing out where there are through lines and themes that we can start to then move to uh, tactical, which would be, okay, how do we accomplish these specific goals that we want, right? And what we found for Hollywood is completely different than what we found for the fashion district. And what I think we'll hear from Westwood it will be just a completely different planet. Absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. And I think it's understanding that, um, sure, signage, yes, ads, but the thing is is that the media landscape now is so much more, um, there's so many more options to what pipes we can push messages through. So what, how does social media come into play with that? How do we get every freshman Bruin to download the Westwoods Village app or Instagram feed so that they can be kept alert of cool things that are happening in the village? You know, I think there's, there's going to be a lot of just like hard work, just feet on the ground, making things happen, but being aware of... I don't think those kids care about pole banner signs. They've driven by them in the back seats of luxury automobiles for their entire lives and they don't care. So, but what do they care about? They care about cool novel things that they see from their friends. They care about things that get shared on Instagram. They care about little Instagram stories. So how do we make all of those levers work better for us? Um, sure, street banners are lovely, lighting trees is lovely, all that's lovely, but if we're really going to talk about that particular group of kids and, and people, um, we're going to have to talk to them on terms that they understand and in places that they already are. So, Two questions for you. The, the, the first one is, how do, how do organizations like yours help uh, communities like ours overcome just these just sort of um, uh, factors that are out of our control. Um, uh, you know, so issues, you know, homelessness, uh, vacancy. You know, we had a, a really great restaurant that wanted to open here in Westwood. They tried and tried and tried. They had the sign in the window, and, and now it's not there anywhere they couldn't open. And it's a, it's a loss for us. It was also something that was at least somewhat out of our, our control while we were trying to push for change, you know, we have metro construction coming, you know, we can't control that. How does branding overcome um, just these types of uh, factors? And then number two, what what are the first steps that, that an organization like ours would have to take to launch this type of endeavor? Mm -hmm. You wanna do the first one? Yeah, I'll do the first, so I think how branding overcomes that is that branding is a promise, you know, that branding at its best is the promise you're setting, so it sets expectations. And then it's your job to sort of try to exceed those expectations. So I think part of it is that I'm not sure that Westwood um, double on, is making up the bid to the people in in the way that you might want to. You know that it's sort of it's operating, it's functioning, it's got this, it's got that. But largely, um, I'm not sure there's a strong invitation to come. Um, and then once they get here, how do we deliver? How is it welcoming? How is it hospitable? How is it interesting? What's happening? You know, we, we talked with Hollywood about um, a corridor of Hollywood Boulevard that we all know, because <laughs> it's not lovely. Um, and so the first step is branding it, right? Oh, well, it's old Hollywood, so we'll forgive it. But, but then, the second thing we gave them was a tagline, which is history, period, happening, period. So the idea of it's not a relic, it is not a museum, it is dynamic, it is alive, it is a verb, right? So I think that's part of the answer to that, and that branding is also not just a logo. You know, it's a whole set of things <clears throat> organizationally we do to make sure that every person's experience when they come here is unique and memorable and seamless. And you know, there's, I, I used to work with a woman who did a lot of work in this space, and she used to say that when you go into a place, whether you go into a restaurant or to a retail store or to a mall or to a city center, if everything is working, you'll just know it feels good, but you won't be able to really put your finger on it. But if something's not working, that is the thing. Like that will draw your attention and that is what you're gonna get fixated on. So I think that it's also, how do we seamlessly integrate all the parts? Um, but I do, I'm really convinced that 
programming is going to be an essential piece to it. And I know you've done things like that successfully, mm -hmm. so it's like how do we continue to build on that? And um, to your second question, so uh, what we've heard in some of our meetings uh, is that there are some misconceptions or people have uh, preconceptions of what's happening in West Berlin. This is the way it is, this is what's happening, and this is why. And we had faced that definitely with the fashion district. And I don't know if you guys spend a lot of time in the fashion district, but it is a lot of, it's a very, um, like kind of New York y kind of. Uh, very then, urban. Yeah, and then there's also a large, uh, like, many, like more warehousey section. Um, and one of the things that you don't see, and the same thing with Hollywood actually, is that on the upper floors there are all these people that live there. And so this data, and I'm glad you pointed out, we actually do have some, it doesn't show very well on the uh, projector, but we have here used public transit, 21% of residents are more likely. Uh, or, I'm sorry, residents are more likely to use public transit, and it's 21% of residents use public transit versus 10% for all of them. Ah, I see. It doesn't, it doesn't translate that. very well, but it was a really good point. So, um, so those things about how uh, wealthy people were downtown, and you couldn't see it because when you're walking around, it's like buildings and warehouses. Mm -hmm. And so bringing the research piece of it is a real key part of it because the research can challenge some of the um, preconceptions of what's available. And you have all these very um, wealthy, young, creative people that aren't being served by restaurants. So that became a really clear message that we could integrate into our tools for outreach. Um, the other thing that we always start with is um, interviews or a charrette where we sit down and we listen to people. Because usually when you do a couple of interviews, we found this with Hollywood really early on, we interviewed most of the board members, and it's very quickly themes come through if you start talking to different people. So, um, so when we start to do these interviews, you can start to pull themes that aren't from Claire in my experience, but from the people who actually live and breathe it. And being able to put that into a vision that this is not something that is imposed, it's uh, kind of nurtured from within. So that would be our first phase, is a research and a, and a listening to kind of pull together what a vision would look like. And I think that process, um, one, I think that in a lot of ways it can be very sort of healing for the constituents because you get everything aired out and then you figure out, okay, we know we have these things, but here's all of this upside potential. And, it, and the other thing I think that's important is that our work is, it is work, but a lot of the work is done by the people at the table. And it's our job to figure out then how to, how do we put that on the page? How do we say that in just the right way? How do we use our expertise communicating to these audiences the intentions that you all will have for the street? People, people know more than you think that they know, always. I'm always surprised and delighted in a charrette how smart people come, you know, are in the room and how many interesting things they have to say and how many cool observations they have. So ours is to gather that all up and then put it into a package that can be actionable. Because at the end of the day, if it's not actionable, then it's sort of just an exercise in making a pretty document, which is not the point at all. The point is that it's actionable, that that roadmap, we can, we can phase it out and we can figure out how to do it and we know what things we need to prioritize and we know what things, um, and things like homelessness, you know, some of these things can be, um, I think our homelessness thing is, you know, it's at critical mass, we all know that, but I think even giving voice to that is important. So um, Genevieve and I both work on di various initiatives that deal with homelessness and, you know, there's a lot of things happening in communities to offset NIMBY sentiment around supportive housing. Not in my neighborhood, not in my backyard. How do we address that better? How do we, how do we create a community here that with the wealth of intellectual and innovation resources could possibly come up with great ideas to address that? So I think um, you're uniquely kind of blessed with the intellectual firepower that is in this community. And that's why I think this college town idea is so sort of essential. Because that is a, a university a of, of problem solvers. A couple of points on that front. I want to then, the board members, I think many know this, but I want to, you know, people are concerned about the impact of the metro coming in uh, to the village, understandably concerned. Sure. And um, that is going to have 
significant impact, and we're going to need to talk about uh, ways in which we can you know, create a, a maps of access and things like that. But the good news is, around that same time, the university is going to be completing what, roughly 3,000 new bed spaces that are going to be here in the village, effectively. The corner of Lacan and Gailey, it's going to be, yeah. I think, a 1,600 to 70. I, I don't recall the bed numbers. Michael Beck would know better than I. Sure. But there, and then finally, uh, the second phase of what we call our, our, our sort of Wayward Terrace graduate student housing. It's mm -hmm. going to be a mix of upperclassmen and graduate students. So you'll have thousands of new uh, units. Uh, upperclassmen and graduate students living in Westwood by 2022, 23. That, I think, is going to be a really great thing for the village. Uh, it's an opportunity for the village. Uh, and that's going to be happening at the same time that the big street closures are happening. Mm -hmm. So that's a good thing. On the homelessness point, to me, and this is where I'd ask for you when you study college towns to look at street retail. Um, my sense is, when, going to your quote a moment ago, um, uh, about your mentors, mm -hmm. you know, the gestalt of what you, mm -hmm. what's the sense of the place. I feel like, in part because we have so much vacancy in Westwood, there's not a lot of bodies on the street. Yeah. It's just up in Berkeley, and this is, they clearly have as many homeless, as, they, they might even be winning the number of homeless uh, count <laughs> per block than in the sure. Westwood. But there's a lot more people on the street, so they're not foregrounded. Whereas sure. in Westwood, if, you know, Steve's a resident, I'm a resident. You, if you wander the streets of Westwood on a weekend morning, uh, it's gotten better. But I think homelessness is foregrounded here in a way that it's not in a lot of other places. But it's, it's simply more non-homeless people on the street. So I think curing our vacancy problem, if I had to pick one thing to do, mm -hmm. it would be somehow to enliven uh, the street with more people coming here. Yeah. And I think it's slowly happening. But that, to me, is job one, is somehow get more people into the village. Yeah. Um, yeah. So we can talk about this all day. Yeah. Oh, no doubt. <laughs> so uh, that was great. Yeah, um, sure. But Steve, I'll get to you in just a second. But um, like, speaking of actionable, uh -huh. what, do you guys, what do you guys want to do? Well, um, is there a proposal? There's, um, well, I think it's sort of one step at a time. I think, um, I think the, what we need to, to determine first is, is this an endeavor that's worthwhile? I mean, I, I know that Haynes & Co. Would, would, would love our business, um, but we're fortunate that they're here to explain to us what exactly these services are and how, they can, how they've helped other districts and how they could help our district. So do we think this is something that's valuable for us? And then I think step two would be determining how to move forward. And uh, there's there are options. You know, we could go through an RFP process. We could, you know, we could say, okay, well, based on on the work that we've seen, you know, let's let's start negotiating with them. We could also do it uh, with Hansico. We could also phase the work in and say, okay, let's start with one phase and sort of put a toe in the water and see how it goes. So there's there's multiple options, but I think the first one is is this something that we think is worthwhile for for our district? And how does it fit in the budget? Yeah, that's good. Um, we have uh, um, we have yep. budgeted in, in 2020 um, for an item for an item like this. Okay. Is that based on parking district money? Uh, no, no. This would be uh, another one. I guess my, my my concern, my question of concern is how to Peter's earlier point of our general concern about the increasing impact of uh, less access to the village because of metro activity. Um, how would this engagement? Um, help tackle that. I think there's a near-term and a long-term goal for Western, and the near-term yes. challenge is right. really going to be, the, the long-term challenge is, you know, make, is solve the vacancy. There's a lot of them. But in the immediate term, to me, it's we're facing a unique situation with the metro mm -hmm. that's impacted other areas. And I don't know how the branding activity fits within that, I guess, or, or are we going to be selling something that's going to be not realizable because of the metro's blockade impact, and are we going to be engaging something when we don't have a steady state situation to brand yet? Okay. So you know, um, I, 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 I just I just feel like we've got a near term situation uh, that's 
I, I don't even know what the, what the parameters of that are because I haven't studied the impact of other areas. Like, but, but that's my point. Um, thank you again, ladies, for coming to speak to us a second time. I can tell you I am really excited about this. I think it is the thing that Westwood has been missing for most of my life. <laughs> I'm growing up around here and having a business that's been here longer than I have, than I've been alive. Um, and I think, to address your question, I think now is absolutely the critical time to start this work. My hope is that if it is even moderately successful, it may save some of our businesses during this tough, assumed tough time. It may save Westwood during this approaching time. Um, I think it is absolutely worth the risk to do this now. Um, I think the idea of Westwood Village, the village is dead. There's no village anymore. Whatever it is, who are we? It's so lost. The messaging of Westwood, 80% of what's out there, it's negative. It's always a negative story. Even the positive stories always have to bring up, oh, the shooting in the 80s, or the this or the that. <laughs> it's crazy that that still comes up in every story. Um, and so us taking control of that, and hopefully through that, you know, we've been talking now for a couple or a few years about placemaking. But that ball hasn't really, it's like it, it pushes forward and pushes forward, but it doesn't go anywhere because nobody's quite committed, nobody quite understands it. Creating this cohesive concept of who we are, where we're going, then people are going to get excited, and then they're going to want to do the placemaking, and then we're going to have the plaza and all these things. And so there's a massive potential and possibility here, um, especially if the money is, is um, there and we don't need to find it somewhere. Um, uh, as much as I think you two are phenomenally dynamic, I love listening to you speak. You both clearly know what you're doing. Um, I do think it is our responsibility as a board, though, to put out an RFP, to see what other companies are doing. But I think we need to do it fast. I'd like to make some decisions. And I, I want to get to work on this, like now, yesterday. Echo um, exactly what you're saying. So I think the biggest thing with Westwood, and I've been speaking, probably have only been on this job for about five or six months, but probably over 30 different owners, um, pretty big notable ones, national brands, and it's a complete lost identity of what's going on in the village, and I'm hoping the messaging can sit there and figure out what it is. Where I do disagree is I, I think that there's UCLA students, I view as a very small part of it. I think it's uh, much more about the young professionals, the aspirational spender, uh, the, the daily employee that's sitting there right here, oh, and the families in the neighborhood around here. So I think that those are the ones that are being underserved, and I think that we have to go after a clustering effect. I know, you know right now I'm working on five different you know tenants that are all going to only come here if all five of them we can get a deal done together. So each one of them is contingent on kind of the other one happening. And I think that we have to uh, figure out what that is. But simple things as far as the vision, storefront vacancies. So I've met now with Annie Fielden twice. We're doing a partnership with Hammer where all of our vacancies are gonna be branded in a way where it's gonna be something with Hammer coming all the way out. We have to figure out how as landlords that we can do something consistent throughout the village where, you know, what my big concern is, you know, Stin Partners were my good friends. So oh, okay. I, I know Stin very well. <laughs> okay. But he bought Hollywood and Highland and you're his client. Rick Cruz the same way. Like, you know, yeah. you know who you're talking to. You're talking to one individual with yeah. one vision and you're exactly. controlling an entire half yeah. million square feet. Exactly. Here, we're sitting right next to each other, but we might have completely different yep. ideas on how to handle that vacancy, and there's no, no bigger vision than what we're doing, we're, we're, we're gonna fail. So to your point of sort of getting the ball rolling, who is the client? Like, you know, this board, we might all have very different ideas about what <clears> that looks like, but how do we sit there? And that's why I like what you did with the LA, uh, the LA district, fashion district, just kind of bringing all those different yes. owners together. Yeah. What, I think we need a master kind of vision of what this village even is, and I think it starts with, what does an empty vacancy look like? If you look at Westwood uh, Century City, or Westfield Century City, the entire second floor is all vacant. You would never know it because they teamed up with Annenberg, put up these incredible Absolutely. bright pink things. Right. And you and have you, these cultural assets here. You walk right by it. So I, I think that we have to think through very simple things, including the messaging with the, um, the Metro. I mean, with all that's going on, it's gonna be completely disruptive. Yeah. And that would probably be one of the very first things we tackle. But my question to you all, or to the board, is who is the client and how are we going to get some landlords to just put up flimsy signs and completely discourage you know, the pedestrian or other tenants to come and look at that space? So it has to be some 
oversweeping where we're all encouraging to sit at the table and make a decision together, being like, okay, <laughs> we're going to protect our investments by doing X, Y, and Z, and this is how we're going to do it. Okay, i got to open this up to Steve. He's been super patient. No, no. Thank, th thank you for your patience, no. Steve. Go, go ahead. Fine, thank you. Um, I really want to commend the two presenters. Amazing presentation. I did see it the second time, so that's <laughs> fantastic. And I want to say, Matt, I think your comments are very, very smart and on the money. Um, I do think it's very important that you guys go forward with something, but I do believe that you do need to bid this out. These people may very well be your winning bidders standing right here, but I do think you have a, a diligence obligation to let others and hear from others, if for no other reason that you get to hear their ideas for free. If you bring in, say, two or three other bidders, they're going to come up with their own ideas that might be different from these two women right here. And you say, well, we really like that idea, but we think we like these guys better. So I think you absolutely, especially since you mentioned that this is like a seven-year process, I think is what you were saying in Hollywood, that this is not going to be done in a month or two or three. This subway construction is going to be completed in 2027, we hope, or maybe 2020, certainly 2027. So you have time to bid this out and to do this the right way. Um, I absolutely agree, no disrespect to my fellow Bruins, the group that is missing are n other than the students. The folks who live here with enormous buying power capacity, the folks in the Wilshire Corridor, the professionals who have good salaries and not a lot of places to spend, to spend their paychecks. I do want to say, though, that you missed a couple points. There's some bright spots here. Right across the street, this Hammer Museum is bringing in a quarter of a million people. Look at what Annie Felvin and her team are doing because they're doing something right. Notwithstanding the challenges of Westwood, that museum is a rock star success. The Geffen Playhouse is bringing in 125,000 people a year. They have the hottest show, Key Largo, starring um, Andy Garcia. It's gotten national press. It's going on right now. So there are bright spots, and there are people who, are, despite the challenges, are being successful. What's missing is connecting the dots, knitting that together. Audrey is getting a lot of traction. Napa, Skylight, and others. Fellow is doing jazz night on Sundays, but these stories need to be knit together. Um, and I would lastly say that um, one thing that was not mentioned, I hate to say this, is parking. If you ask a lot of these folks in the community, whether it's the reality or the perception, a lot of these folks that have money, they, they, they perceive that it's difficult to come to Westwood or park here. They, they're not scooter riders. They're not, some of them take Uber and Lyft, but a lot of them don't. And so that is also part of the messaging. We have a free parking structure. There's people still 20 years later that don't even know that the Broxton structure exists, as ridiculous as that is. So it's all got to be knit together. But I do think that an RFP is required to go out, and these guys can certainly be among your bidders, and then you move forward. So thank you. Just one other thing that I, I think I would encourage, just hearing kind of everyone's thoughts on this. Um, I think that we have heard from multiple people now, this is going to take a really long time, right? We're, we're using the word branding, but really we're talking about culture, right? We can't make anyone do anything. We have to have them be a part of this change, and that's going to take a significantly long period of time, right? Like, I have to do that every day at my restaurants, but, like, I'm paying those people to understand my culture, so it's a little bit easier. Like, this is, we're all individuals here, right? This is something I have to do. So it's going to take an extremely long time. I would really encourage us to look at what we need to do with this metro experience related but as a separate issue to this overall cultural experience that we're trying to build. Because if we try and put them together, A, it's never going to be fast enough, um, and B, it, it, we're really trying to solve two different problems, right? We're trying to keep things going while this metro project happens, as opposed to we're trying to build a super longevity project on the culture of our district that's going to go way past, hopefully, any of us that are on this board, right? Um, so that would, that's my only comment. Is I really encourage us to see it as two separate projects and to, to think of it as two separate brands. Well, I think as part of an RFP, we can pose that question and ask for people to weigh in on how we deal with the subway and you know how that fits in with the overall plan. Because you know, as you guys have pointed out, one is a very immediate need and one is going to take longer, but. I guess part of the RFP will ask the experts to bring it in. And tell us. No, I support the I support the engagement generally, the notion generally. Just I'm just raising not objections, but just sort of more. How do we navigate the immediate rather the relatively longer term? So I want to be clear that I do. I, I very much support the the okay. notion of, of of this entire effort. And that is, I agree completely with Dean. It's it's past due. Yeah. 
Yeah. One thing I would add is that sometimes it, uh, like with the banner problem with um, the fashion district, it uh, was seemed like an easy like let's fix the, let's make banners, but it was really tied to wait what's the whole story. Now with the metro, I think it's it's going to be affecting Westwood for seven years. That's a that's a pretty long window. Well, um, we've got we've got two years of a lot of pain until they right. turn into mole now and start working underground. Um, <laughs> yeah. And so it'll be two years of massive disruption and right. uh, an, an annoying disruption, but not massive. So, so our process uh, usually takes uh, we've set out a timeline that it can be done in about ninety days to, okay. to create the visioning document, and then we look at it like. Um, you know, uh, rings in a circle. The, the closest part are the board members, that they're the ones who get bought into the, um, the vision that they created. The second level are kind of property owners and business owners. And then the third is the general public. And you work to uh, equip each group with the information. So that's that's how we look at activating. Because I think that was a question that came up. Yeah. Well, and I think to the the question of who's the client, the bid is technically the client, and then the bid acts as the representative of the shared interest and gives us the access to those people as we go through the process. So that's one thing I would say. The second thing I would say is we had a conversation about Metro in our last meeting, and one of the things I think that's essential is um, figuring out how to make Westwood this oasis for this community broadly community, because I agree with you, it's not just the students, in fact, Metro, but the students is probably the least, you know, disruptive. disruptive. So how do we, how do we have things like Metro Mondays, and it's like a dinner <laughs> thing, or, you know, things that can happen for the local community to make Westwood their oasis during this time of sort of upheaval, and there are lots of when I, I lived in Benedict Canyon shortly, and my easiest place to come to grocery shop and to do things was actually Westwood because I could come along Sunset and stay off of these other major corridors. So we need to help connect those dots that this little village is their oasis during a time of really major upheaval. So I have a question. Um, this is the only company that we've listened to regarding the branding? Correct. Yeah. Okay. I just, I, and, and by the way, I, I think that you guys have actually a really good grasp of what Westwood is, but I do think, you know, it's a little premature to sure. go with the company without hearing some, you know. So well, right. and, and what does that process look like? Right. For, uh, the timing of the thing. So what I'd like to propose is that we have the staff draw an RFP. Okay. And then um, we'll assign this to one of our committees in January and let them run with it. By the bar committee, you. Uh, Depending on, you know, I, I think we restaffed all of our committees okay. in January anyway, and so okay. we'll figure out exactly where it should go. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, uh, I make a motion to have the staff start working on a draft RFP so that when we assign Great. it to one of the committees, we're ready to go in January. I second that. Okay. Uh, that uh, yes. Steve? Um, I, I think that's the right approach. I will say the bar committee actually has invested quite a bit of time in this because they did have this presentation, and as you know, I know Dean was there and others, and I do think they had a pretty good grasp of it. Um, so, so as not to delay the process any further, I think obviously you're going to restaff all your committees as you mentioned, but I think they've already begun on this process, and hopefully they can continue to run with it. And um, I think that is the right approach. I'm not. I'm not saying I won't go there. I just know that as we go <coughs> through these committees, we'll figure out which is the best place to put it in January. Yeah, so that's fine. Good. Okay, so, so we have a motion for staff to uh, create an RFP and to agendize the assignment of this item in uh, January 2020. Okay. All in favor? Okay. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Great presentation. I've got a couple of questions. <coughs> Will we as uh, board members have the ability to edit or take a look at the RFP um, before it comes back to the board? Um, yeah, I can definitely. So I'd be good. interested in yeah, seeing it. This is my second time seeing this. Uh, the other thing I just want to make the board aware of, we're six months away from this major, major right. disruption. Yeah, you know, oh, yeah. So, and that, that <laughs> dovetails <laughs> into this last item on the agenda. Yeah. And I don't know if this is something that we actually have a motion on, but 
but I just wanted to bring it up. And it was, you know, it, it's, it's twofold. Um, the first, and I said it in my remarks last week, is um, there's going to be this uh, uh, study of a specific plan by the city planning department. And I think that um, one of Westwood's challenges is that for years, the groups have been talking at each other, the various stakeholder groups, and nobody has been speaking with each other. And uh, what I'd like to do is I'd like to have Andrew and some select board members go out and meet with the various stakeholders in the community to talk about what we have authorized as our vision for parking and restaurant use and hear what the community has to say and see if there's any areas where we agree with each other. And if we disagree with each other, that's okay too. But at least we will understand our positions and it won't be something that has gone through a telephone chain of where it gets twisted and twisted and twisted and you know people think that the bid wants to level all of Westwood and build high rises. And so I think that's one thing that I'd like to do is get everybody talking to each other and see if we can't find some areas of agreement for changing the plan. And then the second related to outreach is related to the subway. And we are going to have to come up with a way to reach the stakeholders around us to support the village. Because if we can't get the community to come together and support Westwood during this disruption, we're probably going to lose some of our businesses. And so we need to, and you know, this, this RFP will dovetail nicely with it, but we need to think about strategies to engage with the community. And that's, that's not only UCLA, it's the homeowners groups, it's the homeowners who aren't part of the homeowners groups. It's getting the people that are south of Wilshire that we don't think about because they're outside of our bid and getting them to come up here. It's how do we figure it out? And as she so aptly put it, maybe it's Metro Mondays, maybe there's, you know, uh, various <coughs> specials that can be put on by the merchants. I mean, I would encourage the merchants to start talking to each other too and figure out, you know, what's the plan for coming up with it. And then we can show some leadership to uh, <coughs> that all come together. And I, I, don't, I don't have the answers to any of this right now, but I think it's something that we all need to think about and, you know, throw out a bunch of ideas and start working on it. I think that's a great idea. When we work together as a community, we make things happen. I mean, I've seen it over and over again. I mean, I'll give you an example of something that's going on right now to the great frustration of Michael Beck. He said, John, did you realize now that the um, metro stations are all being put together exactly the same from a, a parts list? I said, no. I, I mean, so you're telling me that the major portal there on Lot 36 is not going to be UCLA-centric? He says, not unless we pay for it. So, I mean, it's one of those things that the community, I mean, he, when I was on the MTA uh, advisory committee for the Purple Line originally, one of the most exciting things was that Hollywood was going to have a Hollywood-centric station, and, <clears throat> and so on and so on. And you can see it if you ride the metro, that each station is yeah. different. And I'm sure that the community, I mean, all the homeowners associations, the community council, the neighborhood councils, we would all say Metro for UCLA and for our stop here at Wilshire and Westwood and Lot 36, we have to have a station that looks like Westwood Village, UCLA, tells the story, not just this boring book of parts. So, I mean, I think there is tremendous opportunity. I like this idea, you know, to engage the community, have our board members, Andrew, speak to the different homeowners associations, speak to the different councils, get everybody on board with concepts, and then as a, as a whole, going to um, the political process to make things happen. Well, to that point on the metro, I do have some, we, we will be, uh, for the Lot 36 portal, we will be, it'll look some, you know, it'll have a UCLA flavor to it, I think that's very important. Um, but you're paying for it. Yeah, we're paying for some of it, but they're going to be releasing land from us for a number of years and paying for that. So on a net basis, it's not where I, I don't 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 weep too much for us on that front. <laughs> um, but but um, the, the I think it's important. I, I do get Metro's point that there 
it's like Paris metropolitan, you know, you, you go places. There is a need for a consistent, you have to balance out this, here's the metro stop. This is what a metro looks like with neighborhood uh, interest. I'm not sure how that gets done. But I don't know, I, I don't know who is on point for the ostensible main stop here in Westwood, which is gonna be right on the street there, right? That's the, or the, uh, the Chase Bank. Yeah. 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 I, I don't know who is on point for representing the village in discussing with Metro the look and feel of that place relative to uh, the, the kit of parts. Is there anyone? The, the conversation's been, been had. It's, uh, but like John said, they have a kit of parts. They're really pushing this kit of parts. And uh, that's, our comments to them have been, it needs to tell like, the Westwood story. Like, it needs to belong here in our community. It can't be the same station that exists on North. La Cienega or La Brea or in Hollywood or downtown or like that. It needs to be Westwood. But, uh, but what that looks like is another conversation. I still haven't seen that. Uh, I haven't seen a more current design of what they're proposing for the block away. I've seen yours. I've seen that design, the UCLA right. one. And I know in front of Patrick's building there, it's just going to be basically sort of access. Um, but this one I'm not seeing. Um, I think it might be time, and maybe this is something that gets discussed in FAR, maybe. I don't know. Um, but it may be time to allocate some money to printing and distributing some materials to the local neighborhoods. Um, you know, we have our Western Village newsletter, which gets emailed out, but I don't believe that that's particularly effective. Um, and I have no idea how many people are on it versus how many potential um, people are within our general vicinity, the homeowners associations and things like that. Um, and I don't know what's more cost effective, paying for postage or maybe hiring some students to go and just put them in mailboxes. That might be a great way to save money. But for instance, maybe for the next however many years, we start doing a monthly calendar that we literally put mailbox and mailbox to let people know what's going on in Westwood Village. Send them under the stars. This is at the Geffen. This is at this. This is at that. Remind them of what's right here, and then potentially a second document that is a broader thing of, you know, your metro savior or whatever, your metro oasis. You know, again, going out to the neighborhood and reminding them, you've got these great places to eat and these places to shop, and your market is right here, and oh, here's your <coughs> free parking, don't forget. Um, and really just making sure that, you know, we all know it, we assume people know it, but maybe they don't, or maybe they've forgotten, or they just need that reminder. So I think, you know, for the cost of printing some decent materials and putting some stuff together and distributing <coughs> it to the neighborhoods, um, I think might be a simple but effective tool to at least get us started in the right direction. And again, I don't know if we that's a I agree. I guess the we question gotta, we got to get doing that. I agree, but the point I would make is that I think that I think that's precisely what should be included in the charge for the RFP or the whoever we engage, because that communication effort to me is part and parcel of our branding effort. I mean, that might be one of the first phases of it is you know yeah. engaging the community, gathering information. I mean, we as a board don't have you know Andrew has staff and they can do certain things, but we don't have a newsletter team, for example. You know, I don't know if we have time to create that, but it seems to me that the people we were talking to, that, that those are precisely the type of people who can advise on you know, what's worked elsewhere. You saw they had the Larchmont buzz, or I guess that's the Larchmont's own thing. Mm -hmm. But I would look to people like that to guide us on communication strategies uh, with, uh, you know, both in terms of selecting input and communicating uh, activities. Yeah. We, have, we, have, we have outreach. Our newsletter goes to maybe it's about 1,800 right. people. We have social media, maybe there's another 10,000 followers there. But, I, but there's still people that probably don't know how to, how to find us on Instagram or, or Facebook. And how do we reach those people so that we can really start sort of a Choose Westwood campaign so they understand that we are the oasis? I really, I really like that. And, and I think it's and people like that that can form what we already have and build on that, so yeah. I'm saying. Can I have just one quick comment? Yeah. So as far as reaching out, I, I, I couldn't agree with you more. I spoke with a handful of um, different neighbor, um, neighbors around you know, their frustration with uh, what's going on in the Westwood Village. But I think we have to be much more research and fact-based. And I don't think we have that research right now. What's going on right now with retail, we soft goods, it sounds so easy. Oh, just bring in a nice, elegant restaurant and a high-end luxury um, something from Rodeo Drive, which sounds great, LVMH. I've done seven deals with them, talking to them in the village right now. They're completely allergic to Westwood Village right now. Barney's is going out of business. It is 
bankrupt, that's going to be an office building. Like, think through that of like real time what's going on in our environment. And I think it's our job to do the research and do the education so we can sit there and get some of these things right off the bat. And like, I agree, I'd love to have all, all the ones they talked about. I was like, I wish they could be vibrant here, but can you give me another example where that is vibrant? Taverns, one of them, or restaurants in Brentwood. Tavern, Obama had dinner there on Valentine's Day, 7,500 square feet. Because of the labor laws, they're having to shrink down to about 3,200 square feet because they can't sit there and manage a restaurant that size. It's as about as high as it gets to great operators. Uh, Caroline and Suzanne are fantastic. And that's real life, what's going on right now. And we have to better educate the community because I don't think some of the different neighbor, neighbors understand that. I mean, when they sit there and say, well, more Victoria's Secrets. Victoria's Secrets has been declining sales by almost 40% for the last five years. They can't even make rent. That's corporate. And they're not making rent. I mean, they're just sitting there paying it out of their pocket because we have a you know, parent guarantee. That's real life, what's going on with soft goods and stuff like that. And I think we have to be fact-based rather than just, hey, I think uh, retail is you know, struggling. This is what's going on. I mean, with the labor laws in the restaurant business now going to $15, I mean, it's squeezed a ton of profit margin. So we have to better understand it, and we have to have a set of, we have to do the research, have a set of facts to have that conversation, because otherwise it's just us against you, or it, it's, it doesn't seem like an authentic, real conversation. Of like, OK, we have vacancies. I don't want these buildings to be vacant. They've been vacant for 14 years, and it's because they're you know structurally obsolete, and there's no user that wants to fill those walls. It's you know it's real simple. It's a supply demand. The rest of West LA is you know low single digit vacancy, and we have 40 percent of vacancy in our portfolios on one street. So I think that we have to do a better job of educating. We have to be fact based, not just oh this is what my gut says, and then figure out hey these are some ideas for solutions. What are some other ideas for you that could be better servicing you or bring you into the neighborhood? Because I, I think that that's what we have to do. So before having that conversation, I, don't, I just don't want to sit down and say, oh, I don't really have all the facts, but this is my, what my gut kind of says, and this is kind of you know, my agenda that I'm pushing, because it, it can quickly go into, hey, we're just getting fast food or fast casual in this definition, which is silly, but it's also Sweet Green and Idaho Burger. They're changing their businesses based on what's happening in real time, and the formats are getting smaller and smaller, especially with the cloud kitchens and the Postmates and everything else and how that's impacting their businesses. So I just want us to be, do the research, have the facts before we have those conversations. I agree. I think having a group, they talked about that sort of benchmark, looking at what's working elsewhere. Yes. That, that's exactly the kind of street retail facts. I, I mean, my sense like yours is one of the West, problems we have in Westwood is one of what I would call scale. We, what, what's, what seems to be least regularly are the smallest spaces. Because the overhead there is not killing people, and you know, um, we, as you say, structurally, Bay Depth, things like that, along Western Boulevard, uh, stores like Victoria's Secret and others, uh, those have all migrated to malls, or I, I don't know how they manage the overhead, unless unless yeah, they guys, would see Westwood as Rodeo, which is a bunch of lost. You're going to watch them in five years be exactly like yeah. armies. I mean, we're just watching it happen in front of our own eyes. Some no, no, I mean, it's, it's, and it's, guess what? You sit there and ask those people, when was the last time you shopped at Victoria's Secret? Oh, well, I just buy that on Amazon. And that was the exact response that I think that we both got. Exactly. Yep, and so does my wife. And so that store is never going to last. Can I ask you a question? That it relates to what we're, what's happening with the study with the city. For the, for the stores where you have big, the old, Chili's, I think it's the old yesterday's store space, you know. I heard yesterday's was more popular than Chili's. <laughs> yesterday's was one of the greatest sure. things ever. Okay. okay. <laughs> it was, it, it, you know. Can you cut down your store? I mean, it, it, the depth is huge already. I mean, can you create smaller, more, more numerous, smaller storefronts? Can you now, are you allowed to do that now? We're working through a bunch of different things, what we're allowed to do. Okay. It's okay. A, a very I'm just curious, is that even possible with the specific well, it's, it's, yeah. <laughs> it's, um, it's 1028. Right. I want to get any public comments, if anybody has any, and then wrap this up. Um, I'm not exactly sure what you're proposing. I think the general idea of outreach is obviously important. And again, I think, Matt, your comments are very, very intuitive. Um, I, I do think regarding the, the Metro Purple Line, you can maybe ask Jessica because she's been living it for the last umpteen number of years. Um, one thing I do know that the City of Beverly Hills, the Chamber of Commerce took a very proactive stance and they engaged and probably did the best job of the three stations, Wilshire, Fairfa Wilshire La Brea, Wilshire Fairfax, Wilshire um, La Cienega, by far the best graphics are at, at La Cienega and that's because the City of Beverly Hills and the Chamber said, 
we want something that is very branded to Beverly Hills. Um, Metro will pay some money what that construction barrier looks like. There will be one here on the corner by the Chase Bank. There will be a huge one, obviously, on Lot 36 property, and there will be probably a smaller one in front of um, the Tishman Spire mm -hmm. property. That's a conversation we should be having now because that barrier is going to be going up in six or seven months, which is nothing. So if we want branding and messaging, because I do, do think that Beverly Hills made sure like open for business and whatever messaging you want and whatever iconography, the Fox Theater Tower, whatever Geffen, that can be decided of what that's going to be looking like and it's going to be up there for seven years. Who, so, who is on point for negotiating that specific I don't think, location? to my knowledge, I don't know that there is anybody, right? You, you're on point for UCLA. No, and, we, and we're right. using Beverly Hills as our model. Right. Our point, and Metro is, is pushing back hard, but our point is, hey, yeah. That's we well, want to be able to do. If yeah. not, you know, we'll worry about funding. We they already did it in Beverly Hills, Hills, so they can but certainly. We're only negotiating for the one. Our yours one. Right. So I don't know who's negotiating for this. Well, that that's a good question, and that needs to be addressed immediately. Um, I don't know. Maybe Tishman Spire. You know, it's your property. You probably well, have some I'm say. I'm on the board for the Chamber of Commerce of Beverly Hills, and the advantage they have is that they're they're their own entity, and they can they can represent themselves. We're relying on the city of you know the county of Los Angeles. That's that's tough. Well, so whether it's the bid or it's an ad hoc committee of community and property owners and everybody, whatever, but somebody should be having that conversation because left to their own devices, what Metro gives you is probably something you're not going to be happy with, that we are not going to be happy with. So that's point one. And so that's an immediate. That's an immediate. And again, it can't happen fast enough because we're talking June. Um, as far as the larger conversation of outreach, I do think it's very important. And again, I think you know Matt's comments and others it's very important. There's a, there's a group within Holmby Westwood, which is represents the largest and the wealthiest of the four HOs in this area, <laughs> led by Jan Williams, who's a very smart woman, an architect. She served on the DRB for many years, and they are engaging with our neighbors of what they want in Westwood. Um, I do agree. Obviously, we know retail is changing rapidly, and yet people say, "Well, there's retail at Westfield. Westfield is not just all boba shops. There is retail there. So Westfield or now Rodemco, they get retail." And Rick Caruso at the Palisades, he's got retail, and the Grove has retail. So people are saying all retail is not going away, it's just not coming to Westwood. So that's, there's a Thanks. dissonance there on the messaging. Thanks, Steve. All right. Thanks, everybody, for your hard work this year. And uh, we'll see everybody in general. Thanks, everybody.